thanks everyone for joining us today. As Marcy said, uh, today I'm going to be talking about about the significant changes in the 2015 WFCM uh, as also, and also providing an introduction to the WFCM High Wind Guides. Uh, so we've got our copyright information. This course is, uh, you will, can get CEUs through AIA, um, NCSEA, and ICC. Uh, I'm sure you all read the description and learning objectives before you signed up. Um, that way you know why you're here. Uh, so before we launch into everything, uh, you know, not everyone here has uh, used our poll system before, so we like to start off with uh, a couple of poll questions that don't have right or wrong answers. So I'll kick it back to Marcy for this first one. Absolutely. This one's the easiest one. So what is your profession, architect, engineer, code official, building designer, or other? Um, I like to give usually about 30 seconds or wait until about 80% of you have voted. Um, this one, probably no more than 30% or 30 seconds because you all know what you are. So um, there we go. I'm going to close and then I share. All right. So. Today we've got 72% engineers, 17% code officials, 6% um, other, and 3% architects, 1% one, 1 building designers. Okay, so welcome to everyone. We're glad you're here. And then right after that we have another poll question. Let me load that one here. Um, on our, um, when you signed up, there was a question about whether or not you watched the recommended program, um, STD 315, the 2012 w WFCM changes prior to today's webinar. So um, just wondering how many of you might have done that um, so we have an idea of how to go about today. So um, just a little bit longer. It looks like most of you have voted. I'm going to go ahead and share that one, Lori. Um, it looks like 77% have not and 23% have. So Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Well, that's uh, not a problem. We'll, some of this stuff may uh, be new to you guys, so if some of it seems a, a little uh, confusing for any reason, um, it might be worth your time to go back and watch one of those programs. But uh, So, you know, why, why do we design for high wind speeds? Um, well, there's a, there's a lot of good reasons, but the, the primary one is that we don't want our buildings to fall over on us when uh, a high, high wind event occurs. Uh, so wood can be used to withstand very high wind loads. So you see here in this slide, uh, the picture on the left is a uh, safe room that can withstand 250 mile per hour winds and a 15 pound missile, a uh, two by four missile, fired at the structure at 100 miles per hour. So, uh, you know, we can build very strong uh, rooms and structures out of wood. Uh, the one on the right is a picture that we like to chuckle about over in the office here. Uh, this was uh, after Hurricane Opal in Florida. So you can see the deck was designed to meet the uh, Florida CCCL requirements. The house was built before those requirements went into effect. Uh, and as you can see, the deck, the deck weathered the storm wonderfully, uh, but unfortunately the house did not. So with, with increased regulations, you know, we're showing that wood can stand up to uh, stronger and stronger events. Now the WFCM, uh, we have had a version of it around since uh, about 2001, and we got a lot of mileage out of that first edition. So it, the 2001 WFCM was the, a referenced standard in the 03, 06, and 09 IRC and IBC. Uh, in 2012, we updated it, uh, and that then was the reference to document in the 2012 IRC and IBC. Uh, we made some changes again for 2015, uh, nowhere near as large of, uh, of revamping as the, the 2001 to 2012 changes were, but there are still some changes, so we'll go over some of those today. Now the IRC, uh, the WFCM is referenced in the IRC in uh, a few different spots. Uh, you can find it referenced under uh, R30111, 
uh, where it states that the wood frame construction manual is an alternative, uh, a permitted alternative provision. Uh, for buildings where wind design is required or where the, the wind speed is greater than 110 miles per hour, the IRC gives you uh, a handful of options for design because those, if it's greater than 110 miles per hour, you wouldn't be able to use the IRC. And one of those uh, methods for compliance is the WFCM. Uh, for the IBC, uh, you, uh, Chapter 16 for residential structures that were designed with WFCM, uh, you can see that there is an exception for those in the wind loads uh, in accordance with ASC 7 requirement. Uh, now the, the uh, caveat on that is that you can't use it for structures on hills, ridges, or escarpments. Uh, and then again in Chapter 23, uh, you can see that it is referenced in uh, 23091 where it states that uh, you can use the WFCM for bu buildings that are in risk category 1 or 2 only, uh, provided that they meet the limitations that are in the, the WFCM scope. Uh, and we'll talk about those limitations in a minute here. But so I just want to emphasize that uh, it is only risk categories one and two. So you do want to be aware of that. Now some of the limitations of the WFCM are called out in chapter one. And these uh, applicability limitations generally deal with the size of the structure and the loads that are on it. So um, you can see that the we're, we're dealing with structures that are going to have an, a mean roof height less than 33 feet or three stories, uh, and the dimensions of the building would have to be less than 80 feet. So it's easy to see a house complying with that. Uh, and then in terms of you know small commercial um, single story structures, you know where a, you have a slab on grade and your length and your width are less than 80 feet. So some examples. Uh, might be you know restaurants or small office buildings. These are great uh, examples of buildings that you can design with the WFCM, uh, and you can use the WFCM not just for the gravity loads but also the lateral loads, and it's really a great uh, time saver. So here's another poll. So we'll let Marcy administer it to you guys. Absolutely. Sorry about that. All right. Okay, I'm sorry, I have lost it. I can't quite see where it's at. There okay. it is, sorry. The 2015, everybody else could see it, I just couldn't. The 2015 WFCM can be used to design commercial buildings per the 2015 IBC, true or false. All right, and that seems most people are voting. About 10 more seconds. We're almost at that 80% threshold. And then I'm going to go ahead and close and share it. All right, so we've got 91% say true and 9% say false. And the real answer is... All right, so it looks like the, the most, most of you were listening. That's good. Uh, the answer is true. So some commercial buildings, right, as long as they are within the scoping requirements of the WFCM. Uh, so let's, let's get into the, the meat of the document a little bit more. Uh, the WFCM only has three chapters. Chapter one uh, is going to provide the general overall limitations, some charging language, um, some references and things like that. Chapters two and three are uh, kind of parallel paths to the same end. Chapter two is an engineered design path, and chapter three is a prescriptive design path. Uh, and those are both organized in uh, the same order. Uh, connections first, then floor systems, wall systems, and roof systems. And yes, we do realize that this is kind of the opposite of the order that you would design the building in, um, but it is consistent with the layout that's in the IRC, so that's why we chose it. Uh, and the, the WFCM also has a supplement, so that's going to be 
uh, similar to what's in the NDS supplement. You know, there's some design values, some additional information uh, that will help you in, in your structural design. So chapter one, uh, again, has scoping requirements. Um, it's going to talk about uh, the r restrictions on the structure size. Uh, we also have some requirements as far as the, the load on the structure. Uh, you can see that for a wind load, uh, any wind speed between 110 and 195 miles per hour, and that's the 700-year return uh, that is now in ASC 710 that they're using. Uh, in terms of ground snow load, we go from 0 to 70 pounds per square foot, so if you're in a higher snow region, uh, you unfortunately won't be able to use the WFCM. Uh, and then for the seismic design category, you can be in categories A, B, C, or D. Uh, so as far as when we quantify a mean roof height, uh, we provide this illustration to make sure that everybody is measuring the mean roof height from the same place. Uh, so from if you have you know, a walkout basement where the grade on one side of the structure is not equal to the grade on the other side, you would use the average grade. And then the mean roof height would be measured from that average grade up to the mean of your pitched roof. So it wouldn't be to the top, it would just be to the middle of that pitched roof. Uh, again, three-story maximum, so what we count as a story is shown here in, in the uh, illustration on the right. And then the length and width of the building, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have to be less than 80 feet. So all of our design loads are coming out of ASCE 710, right? So uh, as we said, seismic design categories A through D, um, those are going to be per uh, Chapter 12, Section 14, the Simplified Alternative uh, Structural Design Criteria, and that's for uh, simple bearing wall or building frame systems. Uh, and then, the, as I mentioned, the wind speeds look higher than they used to be, and that's because we've gone to a 700-year 700, 700 return, um, and snow loads are uh, just 0 to 70. So what is not included in the WFCM is just as important as what is included. Uh, so we, we call the items that are not included, uh, ancillary structures, right? So that would be things like decks, balconies, carports, porches. Uh, those are not included in the WFCM. If you need a good deck document, though, check out our DCA-6. Okay, so now moving into Chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2 is our engineered design path, right? So we're treating the building as a system um, and as that system needs to resist the loads that are imposed on it. So those, those loads, are, our end goal is to have those lo loads transferred down into the supporting soil. Uh, so we do that by maintaining continuous load paths throughout the structure. And you know, ideally, you want to have multiple load paths. Uh, so wood buildings are great for that. We have um, lots of redundancy in our designs, so we have multiple load paths, but the crucial point for that load path really is the continuity being created by the connections. So you need to ensure that your connections are designed for the appropriate loads that are being applied. Now chapter two, I said, um, is kind of a parallel path to design uh, alongside chapter three. Uh, however, since Chapter 3 is more prescriptive you would, and Chapter 2 is an engineered design, you obviously would expect Chapter 2 to be a little less restrictive. Uh, so you have some number crunching you have to do in Chapter 2, uh, but we provide lots of tables to assist you, so it helps shorten up the amount of calculations you have to do. So when you go into, into Chapter 2, you're going to see a list of tables, right? We've got 17 shown here. Um, and uh, on the right here is an example of uh, ridge connections, sorry, ridge connection loads. So this is uh, a table that will help you determine your 
loads on either your ridge beam or ridge board, as it were, for different wind speeds. We've got another one here, table 22A. This is your uplift connections. Uh, so this is the uplift force that your connection has to resist. And what it does is it tells you the amount of force that the connection has to resist, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. So you can use you know, nails, you can use uh, straps, um, proprietary connectors. It doesn't specify how you need to resist these loads. Uh, it just helps you determine the loads that need to be resisted. So if you take a look now at table 2.2a, you'll see that we've got all these individual cells for various uh, roof ceiling design dead loads, right? So each of those cells represents uh, one calculation. And if you go into the commentary here for table 2.2a, you will see all of the calculation that went into developing just one of those cells. So we've done a lot of work to help simplify the calculations for you guys and uh, kind of streamline the process. So uh, it really is a great time saver. Now chapter three, uh, as I mentioned before, it's going to be a little more restrictive than chapter two. And one thing that uh, jumps out in, in the right opening of, uh, of chapter three is that the wind requirements in chapter three are provided for buildings listed in exposure categories B and C. Uh, so if you need to design something that's in exposure D, then that's going to need to be designed per chapter two. In terms of overall design methodologies, you know, everything is the same. Uh, for both chapters, I do want to mention that you know your shear wall design in both chapters is going to be the same. You have the option of using perforated design or uh, full heights, individual full height segments. Um, but there are additional restrictions in chapter three, and those are going to be shown here in table 3.1. So some of them that you know I can point out to you guys is uh, for roof snow loads, for example the tabulated spans only go up to 20 feet. Now, you can have longer ones, but you might have to uh, calculate some, some numbers yourself or go into Chapter 2 to make it work. Uh, there's also some additional limits on uh, shear wall offsets and also on the, uh, let's see, <laughs> lost my place, sorry. There, so there's, there's additional restrictions um, in the prescriptive chapter. Uh, one thing that we added this in 2012, but I do want to make some of you guys aware of it because some of you folks are, are um, just getting up to speed with the 2012, is that we've uh, added dropped and raised headers to, we now have tables for both dropped and raised headers. Uh, so uh, those are, allows you to, you know, they're helpful in complying with some of the energy requirements. Um, one thing that we did add that was all new was the header spans that are supporting uh, roof and ceiling. We've changed the deflection limits. So it used to be uh, an L over 360 deflection limit. Now we've changed it to an L over 240 deflection limit. Um, so this is going to be consistent with the deflection limits that are shown in IRC uh, table R802.5.1 and IBC table 2308.7.2. Uh, we also have some tables uh, for brittle finishes. Now these are, are going to have that L over 360 uh, limit for brittle finishes, and then flexible finishes would be there's also tables for flexible finishes included as well. So we, we denote uh, brittle finishes as plaster and stucco. Uh, flexible finishes would be something like a gypsum board. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Uh, an another change was that the new Southern Pine design values were incorporated. So 
uh, in the 2012 version, we had addenda that were released for the NDS that uh, addressed the changes in southern pine design values. So those have been incorporated fully into both the 2015 NDS as well as the 2015 WFCM. So you'll see uh, revised tables that deal with your joist and rafter spans as well as uh, headers and studs. So those are the, the main changes uh, in the 2015 WFCM. Now to accompany the 2015 WFCM, we developed the high wind guides. Uh, so we've got Exposure B and Exposure C, and these are all available on our website right now. You can download them for free. Uh, so you'll notice that Exposure B, we have uh, 115 mile per hour up to 150. And then for Exposure C, we have 115 miles per hour up to 160. Uh, and you might want, wonder why we don't have 160 mile per hour uh, guide for exposure B. Uh, that is because once you get a, above 150, you're required to design as exposure C. So uh, you won't see any, any exposure B higher than 150. So the high wind guides, uh, they take what's in the WFCM and they make some additional uh, assumptions and some additional requirements uh, beyond what's in the WFCM and they provide, it provides prescriptive solutions for walls, floors, and roofs. Uh, so this takes the prescriptive elements that are in Chapter 3 and it makes them even more simplified. So when you open uh, the high wind guide, um, you can see this is an example from the 140 mile per hour exposure B guide, uh, and that's what we're going to refer to in, in all of our examples today. Um, but you'll see we've got tables that, and sections that address every element of the house that you're going to need to design. So as I mentioned, there are some additional limitations beyond what's in the WFCM. Um, one of those is that we have a maximum opening height of 6 feet 8 inches. Uh, there, there is an exception that will allow you to go up to 8 feet in some instances. We also require that the exterior walls be fully sheathed. Um, that is not necessarily a requirement in the WFCM. The WFCM will allow you to calculate the uh, a requirement for the amount of full height sheathing segments in general, but uh, does not have that exterior wall uh, requirement. So the high wind guides require the exterior walls to be fully sheathed. For the 140 mile per hour guide, we have uh, a, a limit on the building aspect ratio. It needs to be between 1 and 2.75. Uh, some of the lower speeds, you can go as high as a 3 to 1 aspect ratio for the structure, but uh, for the 140 mile per hour today that we're going to be working, we have a, a maximum of 2.75. So we've got a general nailing schedule that is included in uh, the high wind guides, and you can see we call out a lot of 10D and 16D nails. Uh, now these are smooth shank nails that we refer to. Uh, in the WFCM, so the 2015 WFCM and the WFCM high wind guides only specify smooth shank nails, um, and that ties back to the NDS reference on smooth shank nails, which are per ASTM F1667. So if you want to use something other than the smooth shank fasteners that we've specified, you can uh, get some information on your alternative fasteners, whatever they are. Uh, you have a few s sources of information. You can uh, discuss it with the manufacturer of the product. Um, you can obtain an ESR, so one that is, is um, pretty common is ESR 1539, uh, which is of, by the International Staple Nail and Tool Association, or ISANTA. So that provides some equivalency for uh, deformed shank nails. 
uh, and or you can discuss it with your engineer and calculate. Uh, you know, if you have some sort of proprietary system, you have to calculate it and have an engineer uh, provide their stamp for it. But so everything that we're referring to today is going to be a smooth shank fastener that's uh, in compliance with ASTM F1667. So now we'll take a break and uh, we'll have Marcy come back for our third poll question. Absolutely. So, all right, we've got the WFCM high wind guides have no additional limitations beyond those imposed in the scope of the WFCM. Is that true or false? About 15 more seconds. Just a few more. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and close and share. All right. So we've got 85% say false and 15% say true. Not quite as clear cut. Um, well, the Lori? Yeah, the majority has it on this one. Um, it is false, so right. The, we, we made you guys pay attention with the wording of the question is what it was. So yes, the WFCM guides do have some additional limitations like we talked about. They require uh, that the exterior of the structure be fully sheathed um, and as well as uh, some other things we talked about. So the thing I like about the high wind guides uh, is that they've got really great illustrations. So, um, you know, you'll see in there, when you go in there, we've got uh, this one, for example, for wall-to-wall -wall connections. We talk about, you know, using an uplift strap. We talk about each uh, nail, each connection, and there's, um, you know, an, a reference, an arrow that points to which table you have to go to for, for that connection. Um, one thing I do want to point out to you guys is the leftmost picture in this illustration, though, because we're going to talk a lot about uplift loads, about lateral loads, and about shear loads. So I just want everyone to be on the same page as to what direction we're talking about the load being applied in uh, as, we, as we go through. So uplift, obviously, is going to be a load that's pulling up. A shear load would be a load that is going to be uh, in plane or parallel to the wall that is resisting it, and then a lateral load would be perpendicular or applied to the face of the wall. So let's go into a design example. That, um, you guys may have seen this house before. This is our WFCM house. Uh, so the assumptions are it's in a 140 mile per hour exposure B zone. We're assuming that it has a length of 36 feet and a width of 30, uh, a roof pitch of 5 and 12. The height from the top plate to the ridge uh, for the roof is 6.25 feet. Uh, that it's got two stories under it that are have eight foot wall heights. The door heights are 6 feet 8 inches, and we've assumed a window height of 4 feet. Uh, we are assuming that the exterior sheathing is wood structural panels, and we have gable and walls. Uh, and also note that the width of our windows is 2 and a half feet. I don't know if I called that out on the slide. But so, so let's start at table 4, right? This is our anchor bolt spacings for a 5 eighths inch anchor bolt. Uh, so you can see we have anchor bolts that are uh, our raised floor foundation is supporting a roof, a ceiling, and two floors. So our uh, length over width is 36 divided by 30, so it gives us our um, aspect ratio of 1.2. So you can interpolate, and you'll see that 
the spacing, the required spacing is uh, 47 inches for our anchor bolts. Now, if you go into the uh, language uh, just above this, you'll see that we also do require those 3x3 three three plate washers with the 5 eighths inch anchor bolts uh, for uh, the 140 mile per hour. So you'll want to ensure that you read through all the, the text as well. It's, there's not a lot, but it does have some important uh, elements on it. So now we look at our stud lengths, right? So this is uh, going to be on page 12 in the guide. So we've got uh, our wall heights are 8 feet. So for our non-load bearing studs, uh, our maximum for a 2 by 4 stud wall, uh, that's uh, stud grade rather, that's uh, going to be 10 feet 6 inches. So that's greater than our 8 feet. So that's good. And then when we go to our load-bearing studs that are supporting uh, the roof, the ceiling, and one floor, so that's going to be our, our first floor load-bearing studs. Uh, again, 16 inches on center. Uh, you can see they have a maximum height of 9 feet 9 inches. So for both of them, we are uh, within the limits, so our 8-foot wall height is okay. So for our top plate splice, right, so this is, again, right, you just go through the picture and it tells you uh, every connection, every table, uh, there's a picture that accompanies it. So for the long dimension of the building, the 36-foot dimension, uh, you can see a 2-foot splice length is not going to be permitted, uh, so we'd have to go to a 4-foot splice length. And we need 16, or I'm sorry, 14 16D common nails for each end of the splice. Um, when you go to the smaller side uh, for 30 feet, you can interpolate here, and you see that we'll need 12 nails. Okay, so back to this picture, right? So now we're going to start designing some of the elements uh, that we saw in this in uh, this illustration. So first, let's take a look at that uplift strap in in uh, table seven. So you can see it here in the upper right uh, picture. So for our stud spacing at 16 inches on center. Uh, our wall, our, this is going to be for our 30-foot wall. We can interpolate, and we'll see that we need a uh, uplift strap that is capable of resisting 203 pounds. And for our lateral, our requirement would be two uh, 16D common nails and nailed for each connection. All right, and it's that easy. I know the first time I, I tried using this, I thought there had to be more to it, but it really is supposed to be that easy. All right, so now this is for our roof, for our uh, overhang, right? So there are two ways you can frame your rake overhang. It can be framed without structural outlookers, and you can see the um, drawing of that on the left side. And then it can be framed with structural outlookers, uh, and that's going to be uh, represented by the drawing on the right. So depending on how you want to frame it or what your structural needs are for framing it, um, you'll need to design this plate to stud connection uh, per table eight. And then if you're framing it with structural outlookers, you'll have this uplift connection per table nine. So again, right, we just go into the table, we look at our wall height, we know that it's 8 feet and our stud spacing is 16 inches on center, and we can see that we have to provide 164 pounds of uplift resistance, and our plate to stud connection requires uh, two 16D commons and, that are end nailed. Now if you're framing, if you're um, using structural outlookers to frame it, right? So you would just pick your outlooker spacing and the uplift capacity of the outlooker would be specified in the table. So if we chose a 12 inch on center spacing, we'd have to have a 304 pound uh, resistance provided by that connection in uplift. 
So for our window width, we said that the maximum width of the window was two and a half feet. So we can use one two by four for our window sill. And you see that uh, we can't interpolate to one and a half studs, so we will need two full height studs. Uh, but our lateral requirement is 161 pounds, and that can be interpolated. Now we uh, would need our headers. These are going to be our headers now in our load-bearing exterior walls. So for the window, again, we'll interpolate, and we see that our minimum header is going to be either two two-by-fours, or you can use one two-by-six. Uh, again, you can interpolate to one and a half studs, so you will need to use two full-height studs at 16 inches on center. But you can see that uh, the window uplift is interpolated as 330 pounds, and then a lateral, again, is going to be 161. Now, when we go to the door, that's a little more straightforward, so that's nice. Uh, the door spacing is, f or I'm sorry, the door width is five feet. So our minimum header is called out as two two by eights there. Uh, we need three full height studs at 16 inches on center, right, our spacing. Um, so we need three full height studs. Uh, for bearing, and then the uplift and lateral don't need to be interpolated in this case, so we can just pull them straight out of the table. Now, as I mentioned, the wood frame construction manual, the, the Big Daddy WFCM, will allow you to design using either individual full height segments, or some people call that, you know, the segmental approach, uh, or you can use the perforated method, perforation perforated shear wall method. Uh, with individual full height segments, you obviously will need more hold downs at more locations. Um, the high wind guides, remember we said they have, uh, they make things a little simpler in some instances and they make some assumptions. So this is one of those places where those assumptions are made. The WFCM high wind guides only use the perforated method in their shear wall design. So they are assuming that you only have hold downs at the ends of the walls, right? And that we're, and they do account for the openings through, use, through the use of that perforated shear wall design method. So once we start getting into shear wall design, right, so for our load bearing walls, if we start out uh, this is in the, the long dimension, so the 36-foot dimension. So if we're looking at our second floor, where we've got, uh, if we're only supporting a roof and a ceiling, right, we know that our length over width is 1.2, so we'll interpolate. But first we're going to look at uh, a 6-inch edge nail spacing and a 12-inch field spacing. Uh, and you can interpolate and see that the percent of full height sheathing that's required on each exterior wall line is 36.2% uh, or about 13 feet. And we have 23.5 feet available, so we're okay. And then from there it just uh, specifies a hold down capacity of 4,360 pounds. So you go to your preferred uh, hold down manufacturer catalog and you can pull out a model that has that capacity for the second floor. Now if we go into the first floor, all right, we'll take a look at uh, the 6 and 12 spacing again and when we interpolate we see that we have a full height sheathing requirement of 59.8% which is uh, 21 and a half feet. So we only have 21 feet available, so this is actually not going to work for this instance. So what we'll do is we'll go to a tighter spacing. We'll go to a 4-inch edge and a 12-inch field spacing. Uh, so when you interpolate that, you'll see that we are required to have 46.8% of full height sheathing, or about 16.9 uh, feet. And we've got 21 feet, so we're okay there. And you can see that our hold down capacity for the first floor then would be 5,900 pounds. So the uh, required 
hold down on the first floor could, would have to support the first and second floor. So you would add that 5,900 pound requirement from just the first floor with the 4,360 that we got from the previous slide. So now, but what about the minimum building dimension, right? When you're in the W dimension. So this is the 30 foot dimension or the gable end. So for the second floor, right, we see that we need to have, um, we have, have a requirement of 47.4% or 14.2 feet of full height sheathing. So we didn't, have, I didn't show a picture of the sides of the house on this. Um, so we just need to ensure that our openings are 15.8 feet or less of our 30 foot dimension. Uh, and again, you can see the hold down capacity is 4,360 pounds. Now for the first floor, uh, we'll try that 6 and 12 spacing again. We see that we need 75% uh, of the structure to have full height sheathing. So on that, we're going to have a maximum opening width on the first floor of only 7.5 feet. Uh, so our hold down capacity again would be 4,360. Uh, so our combined hold down force on the first floor is 8,720 pounds. So when you go to specify your hold downs, uh, we've got a figure right that shows our corner stud hold down detail. Obviously, um, these hold downs are proprietary products. So you need to ensure that you are installing them per the manufacturer's specification. Uh, so we provide this um, in, in our document, but if the manufacturer says you need to do something else, uh, you need to follow what the manufacturer is telling you. So for the first floor, we had uh, our controlling hold down is going to be the 10,260 pound requirement. So we'll just use that at all four corners on the first floor. Now for the second floor, those hold downs right, aren't resisting as much. Uh, they're only carrying the second floor. So those hold downs on the second floor would only require 4,360 pounds of capacity. So the, where you've got the either trusses, eye joists, or rafters uh, connecting in at load-bearing walls, uh, you need to calculate that connector requirement. And again, um, we're not telling you, uh, you know, how, how to connect it. We're telling you what the forces are, and you can then select uh, whatever you need in terms of proprietary connectors, in terms of engineered connections uh, that you've designed using commodity products, whatever. Um, but for our example, we have our rafter. We're going to assume that our, our rafters are spaced at 16 inches on center so that they line up with our studs. Uh, and again, we'll interpolate. So this is going to be, this example is for the 30-foot dimension, right? Our roof is, our roof is uh, spanning 30 feet, rather. So we can interpolate and see that we need to provide 300 pounds of uplift resistance. 171 pounds in the lateral direction, right, that's in the plane of the wall, or perpendicular to the plane of the wall, and then the shear is 89 pounds, and that's going to be parallel to the plane of the wall. Uh, ridge straps are another one, right? You can get these from any of a, a number of manufacturers. Uh, all we do is provide the roof span and the roof pitch, and you can use whatever uh, ridge strap manufacturer that you like the best. So for us, for a 30-foot roof span, uh, we've, and we've got, we just said we had a 5 and 12 pitch, so we've got a requirement for our ridge strap to uh, support 274 pounds per lineal foot. So these are some illustrations, uh, some pictures um, that one of our uh, field staffers, Mr. Matt Hunter, made uh, that we can kind of take around and show people different ways to use uh, different wood connectors. 
So these are installed on models. They are not installed on actual buildings. So there may be, you, if you look at them closely, you may say, hey, you know, that's, that's not how Simpson or USP says to install that. Um, but these ones aren't re resisting wind loads. They're just resisting the loads that come with getting carted around. So if you see something that's not installed uh, properly, you know, don't blow up our question box, we, we know. But so, uh, like I said, the WFCM and the high wind guides, they're going to specify capacity requirements for these engineered connectors, the straps, the hold downs. The manufacturer of that product is then going to give you the capacity of their individual components. So, you know, we're not saying you need to use something that was manufactured by uh, MyTech or you need to use something that was manufactured by Simpson. Uh, you can select whatever product you like. It just has to comply with the capacities that we have presented uh, in, in, the, uh, in either the WFCM or the high wind guide. All right, we got another poll here. Okay, so the 2015 WFCM High Wind Guide uses the what method for shear wall design? Is that the segmented method, the per perforated method, the force transfer around openings method, or all of the above? All right. Still waiting for about 10 or 15 more percent. Give you about maybe 15 more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close. And we've got kind of all over the board. We've got 59% say perforated, 33% say all of the above, 7% say segmented, and 1% says force transfer around openings. So, Lori, I'm going to let you tell them what the real answer is. All right. Well, if this one was uh, who wants to be a millionaire, then the majority would have it. It is perforated. So we said that the high wind guides only use the perforated uh, design method for shear walls. They, the assumption with that then is that you only have hold downs at the ends. Uh, the WFCM, right, the, the uh, manual itself will allow you to use the segmented approach and have more hold downs throughout the structure, but the high wind guides, that's one of those assumptions they make to uh, simplify things, and so they assume perforated. So, uh, as I said, you know, the, the 2015 uh, changes in the WFCM weren't nearly as uh, long or drawn out as the 2012, but if you want some more information on them, uh, we've got a white paper on our website, so please check it out. Um, as well as just check out our website, uh, which won an award for our redesign. So a shout out to Brian Knight, our IT guy. Uh, we also have some additional articles uh, on the changes in our other standards that were updated in 2015. So the 2015 NDS, uh, as well as the 2015 Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic. So you can check out our website uh, for copies of those articles as well or in your back issues of Structure Magazine. And because we need to get one more poll in, we got one more. All right, here we go real quick. The WFCM High Wind Guide specifies what for connections such as ridge straps, uplift straps, and hold downs? Minimum capacity requirements, quantities, manufacturer name brands, or model numbers? Wow, 43% have voted, and it's unanimous so far. All right, great. All right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close and share. Almost unanimous. 
So 98% said minimum capacity requirements. All right, great. It was minimum capacity requirements. So, so wonderful. Glad you guys were paying attention. So again, right? We don't want to. We don't want to make you guys choose a specific manufacturer. You know, uh, nothing like that. So it's just the capacity requirements for connections and connectors. So if you're using you know, uh, any sort of proprietary product, you can use it in conjunction with the high wind guides and the WFCM uh, because you just need to know the capacity of the product. So I think that is the end of our, yeah, that is the end of our prepared materials section here. So. We are going to bring, I believe Michelle is going to join us, and we're going to take some questions. Okay, Lori, great job. Can, you can hear me. Okay. Can you adjust your mic, Michelle? You'll sound a little far away. Okay. That's much better. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, great job on the webinar. Thank you. And there are a few questions. Um, one question is, where do you find the high wind guides? Um, okay. Well, if you can show your desk. Yeah, let's check out our website here. Let me get this up. So, okay. Are you guys able to, there we go. We should be able yep. to see. So, see if you go to codes and standards on our website and then click on publications you'll see we've got the wood frame construction manual here so we're looking at the 2015 today so let's check that one out and then if you scroll down you'll see all of the exposure B and C high wind guides that we have available so we talked about the 140 mile per hour exposure B uh, today, so you can just click here and download the PDF, and uh, and it'll pop right up. So okay. once my thing is done downloading, <laughs> so they're all available <laughs> for free. Yeah, there we go. All right. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Um, ready for another question? Yes, ma'am. So a uh, question came in regarding the standard nailing requirements for shear walls, um, okay. as shown in the shear wall tables. Could you go over that for yeah, a let's minute? Yeah, let's go back to those. So for the high wind guide, all right, here's one. All right, so the nailing requirements in the shear wall tables, okay, are called out. Let me see if I can get this highlighter, the pen to work thing. I always have problems with it, but we'll give it a shot. So you'll see in this top portion of the table, this is where you're getting the nailing requirements for those shear walls. So your edge spacing and your field space, well, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of options for field spacing. It's pretty much going to be 12 inches on center. But the edge nail spacing is what you can vary. So we've got options for six inches on center, four inches on center, or three inches on center for uh, shear walls. And, then, and that's using an AD common nail. And 12 uh, yes. field nail. Yes. So, so your choices are six and 12, four and 12, or three and 12. Great. And um, one question came in. I don't know if one of the slides mentioned that. It just said, uh, eight penny nails and could you go over a little bit about specifying nails is eight penny enough or what right. more information okay so yeah you, we call and that's a, a great question so you see here we have called out 8d common so when you go into the best place uh, to look for it is going to be in your NDS so I'm actually going to open mine up the NDS appendix L is uh, available to give you dimensions on fasteners. So if you've got a question about uh, dimensions on yeah, on box, on the difference between the box common and uh, sinker nails on the, you know, what means, uh, what does a 60 common have uh, as its diameter versus a, you know, a 60 box? Well, they aren't the same uh, because that would make things too easy for us. So the 
proper terminology, you'll want to use not just the penny weight, which would be, you know, 6D is uh, referred to as a six penny nail, or 8D in this example is an eight penny nail. So you want to specify both the penny weight and the type. So that's why you see here we've got specified 8D common. Okay, and then if they're using other types of nails, they should specify the length, the diameter. Absolutely, you want to ensure that there's no ambiguity in uh, the type of nail that you're specifying. Right. Okay, I have another question. Um, someone asked about whether brick is considered brittle and um, the limitations of the tables for designing st or um, the prescriptive design of studs. And I believe the tables only go up to L over 360. That is correct. So um, I do not know off the top of my head what the deflection requirements are for brick. Um, it might be as much as H over 600. And if yeah. it's brick veneer, it depends on the manufacturer, I believe. But right. um, So in those cases, since the tables only go up to H over 360, what would the engineer need to do? They would need to do a deflection check independent of the WFCM. Um, you know, that probably, that uh, could be something that you would want to run through uh, the NDS deflection checks. Um, okay, yeah, that's... That probably, probably is the, the best bet, yeah, is just using the NDS provisions if, if there's doubt. That's great. Um, one other question, and I... Um, I have the answer for it, so I'll just go ahead and... <laughs> <laughs> those, are the, those are the best kinds of questions, right? <laughs> so anyway, one, uh, uh, one attendee said um, there was something at, earlier in the presentation about the upper limit of 110 miles per hour um, being the limit for using the IRC at, for wind design, and that has actually been removed. It was oh. in the um, 2012... WFCM, and it's no longer stated in the same location in the 2015 WFCN, but what it does is in the 2015 it defers to a map that shows shaded area where wind designs are required. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what it basically comes out to is anything greater than 130 miles per hour, that's ultimate wind speed. Uh, roughly about 114 allowable stress design will need to be designed using wind, de you know, will need a wind design. Um, and New England is exempt from that, though. Okay. Okay. Good to know. And then how are we? Oh, I think we're ready to close it out. We're at uh, other. Might want to bring Marcy on. Yeah, we've got a few other uh, housekeeping <laughs> things that Marcy will want to get everyone in before the hour. Sure, sounds good. All right.